Eden Memorial Chapels understands Jewish funerals can take many forms. Some are very orthodox, while others are more conservative or of a reformed nature. There's no one better in New York or New Jersey. Go to EdenMemorial.com. It's more money with leading economist Steve Moore. Stephen Moore is with us, economist. With more than 30 years' experience as an economist and as a leading thinker of government on business, showing deep understanding of the shifts in the global economy, he's leading economist Steve Moore with more money on Talk Radio 77 WABC. Now, here's your host, Steve Moore. Good afternoon, folks. This is Steve Moore. This is the More Money Show on WABC Talk Radio, the number one talk radio station in these United States. Always a privilege and pleasure to be talking to you on these Saturday afternoons. We're on 1 to 3 p.m. every Saturday afternoon following the great Larry Kudlow. And we are live. We are live uh, in color. And we will be taking your calls this week. I want to hear from you. So much has happened in the last week or two that I want to get everybody caught up on. And I want to hear from you about how you feel the state of the race. I'd love to hear from some Kamala Harris fans. We are right to a uh, right of free speech here. So we like to hear from people with all different per- political perspectives. But since the last time I talked to you all a week ago, it looks like uh, it's it's unquestionable that Donald Trump right now has big mo. He's got the big momentum. And you're seeing that in all the polls and the betting markets. Uh, and Trump uh, has pulled ahead. The, unquestionably, he has. What a difference from a week ago or, or two weeks ago or three or four weeks ago when Kamala Harris was the Mother Teresa of uh, presidential candidates who could do no wrong. And my thesis, by the way, and I want to talk to you all about this throughout the next couple hours. We've got great guests, by the way, coming up. Just fantastic guests. We're going to talk to the great David Stockman, who was the original budget director some 40 years ago for uh, Ronald Reagan. And I'm going to talk to him about what we can do to balance this budget, which is, you know, so insanely out of budget with two trillion dollar a year uh, deficits that are going to ruin our country. So uh, David uh, is uh, somebody I've admired uh, since he was he served with Ronald Reagan, uh, and he is one man watchdog on how to bring government spending and debt under control. So he has some really fantastic ideas. And by the way, I don't agree with. Uh, David on everything, but he is uh, he is a very wise man. And then we're going to hear from John McLaughlin. He's going to give us an update on this race. He's one of the premier pollsters in the country, so he's looking at the data. He'll tell us what's happening, why it's happening, what his forecast is for the next. What do we got? Twenty days, nineteen days? I, I've given. I can't remember what how many days we got. But many Americans have already voted. And many will be voting before Election Day by mail or by absentee ballot. Um, I don't like that, by the way, folks. I'm I'm old fashioned. I think, you know, people should vote on Election Day unless there is some overwhelming reason they can't. And then they should have to go to the court, you know, the courthouse, uh, as I did last election because I was traveling and I showed up at the courthouse and I, I cast my ballot. That way you have a secure system where people can't. You know, the mail in balloting is just so full of fraud that I I think it's just it's not a safe way to have fair and open and um, and elections that are not stolen. And so uh, anyway, I, I think that we need to have we need to get back to Election Day and I'll be voting on Election Day and I hope you all vote and I hope uh, you vote on election day because that's just the way it should be. It's part of our democracy, so to speak. But anyway, so we've got uh, John McLaughlin coming up and then a, a kind of sleeper issue that I want to talk to you all about that uh, this has not, uh, people have not been paying a lot of attention to this is that the Securities and Exchange Commission is now uh, that, you know, they're in, in, uh, in charge of uh, monitoring our stock market and keeping it safe and secure. But they are now monitoring and keeping track of every single solitary stock transaction that you and I and everybody listening to this show 
uh, engages in. And I believe that is a, a an infringement on our privacy rights. I think it is a, a, a violation of the Fourth Amendment, which is a, which protects us against illegal searches and seizures by the government. They are they are uh, they're fishing here. They're fishing uh, for uh, wrongdoing. And I don't want the government to know whether I bought Microsoft and sold Google or I bought General Electric and sold uh, AT&T. Why is that the government's business? And you're talking about tens, if not hundreds of billions of stock transactions that the government is now monitoring. And it's almost like they're standing next to you at your computer screen when you make transactions. And I, I'm sorry, I have a big problem with that. I'm a libertarian. I don't want the government to know those kinds of things about me. And I don't think there's any reason they need to know those kinds of things. And um, so I want uh, I want to talk to Norm Champ, who is a former SEC commissioner about that issue, because I'm up in arms about it. I, I just hate that idea of Big Brother licking over my shoulder. But back to Trump and the momentum that he's picked up. And I want to give you a few thoughts about why that is happening. First of all, I think people realize that when it comes to the economy and it comes to those pocketbook issues, and I've been a Johnny OneNote on this, Trump is the guy. <laughs> and again, that's not the only reason to re- vote for a president. Obviously, foreign policy, uh, commander in chief issues, social policies like abortion, uh, state of mind? Can the person do the job? Those are all big issues. And I know people have differing opinions about uh, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump when it comes to those issues. But when it comes to the economy and who's going to manage the country's finances and help make us a prosperous nation and help us earn bigger paychecks and help us protect our jobs, I think most Americans, and the polls show this, are coming around to the fact that Trump knows a lot more about this, and his track record is far superior to that of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And my new book, which I please, please go out and get the book. Uh, It's on Amazon. We are number one on Amazon in business and economics. Our sales are good. Uh, and it's I think it's like fourteen ninety five, so it's not an expensive thing to buy. But also get it for your friends who are undecided voters, or family members who are undecided voters, or neighbors, or people who just have not made up their mind. And you know, there's ten to fifteen percent of voters who still have not decided who they're going to vote for. There's still that critical 10% or so. And those are the people who will probably decide the outcome of this election. And so I want them to be well-informed. You want them to be well-informed. And when it comes to money issues, they should get uh, the Trump economic miracle. They should look at it and they should see how superior Trump has been on almost every economic issue uh, compared to uh, Kamala Harris and uh, Joe Biden. Now, we have a new study at Unleashed Prosperity coming up, coming out this week, and it has not been published yet, but I'm going to give you a sneak preview of it. My colleague, E.J. Antoni, looked at uh, what has happened to retirement funds, 401k funds, uh, IRA funds, pension funds under Biden. And what he's found is that because of the high inflation, which erodes the value of your savings, and because of the higher interest rates that we faced under Joe Biden, both bonds and stocks, well, bonds have lost value under uh, under Biden, and stocks have not done as they've done well this year. But when you take into account the fact that everything's twenty percent more expensive, your after inflation return was higher under Donald Trump than it's been under Joe Biden. That let me say that again: the S and P five hundred, the Nasdaq, and the Dow Jones are higher after inflation under Trump than Biden, even though Biden took off took office at a time when the stock market was making a comeback after COVID. So that's a pretty impressive thing to uh, to think about. Now, there was a big article in the Wall Street Journal that angered me to no end last week, where you basically had um, the Dow Jones industrial average, I mean, the, the people at the Dow Jones, they, they interviewed 50 economists, 50 of them. And they asked them who's better on inflation and who's better on uh, on the debt. Will it be Joe Biden or will it be, uh, will it be, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Kamala Harris or will it be Donald Trump? And what they found 
in the survey was that most of the economists said, oh, we think that Kamala Harris will be better on inflation than debt. Huh? Wait a minute. The inflation rate under Donald Trump was 1.9%. The inflation rate under Joe Biden, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris has been 6.5%. So that would be like saying, you know, I'm going to I'm going to bring up to bat with two outs in the ninth inning, the guy who struck out the last four times, not the guy who hit two home runs. Uh, and so that makes no sense. I'm here to tell you inflation will be lower if Donald Trump is president than it will be if Kamala Harris is president, because we know from their records. And the other one is debt and deficits. Joe Biden, look, and by the way, Donald Trump does not have a good record on debt and deficits. I'm, I'm a Trump guy, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I try to tell the truth on this show that, you know, we borrowed way too much money under Donald Trump, $800 billion a year. But under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, $1.6 trillion a year, double. Now, a pox on both their houses. Those are disgraceful numbers, but they're worse under Joe Biden. If we get this economy humming again, and I think we will when Trump wins, you're going to see more tax revenue. You're going to start to see the deficit come down under Trump, whereas under the Biden-Harris, their own baseline, their own budget that they put out at the start of this year says that we're going to borrow $2 trillion a year from now until kingdom come. In other words, they have no plan. You hear Kamala saying, I have a plan. No, she doesn't. She does not have a plan to reduce the debt except to run taxes up by $5 trillion, which will kill the stock market, kill businesses, and kill employment. So that those are the, the kinds of choices that we have this year. By the way, the latest numbers show that Trump um, is at 57% and Kamala Harris is at 43% in terms of odds of winning. Now, that's still close. That's still really close. Uh, it's like a three-point uh, you know, spread in a football game. So it's still a close race. But now the Republicans have a 70% chance of winning the United States Senate, and the House looks like it's pretty competitive. The Democrats have a slight edge there. So that's a quick update on what's going on in the uh, overall national federal elections. Uh, we will be right back, folks. My first guest will be the great David Stockman after this message. You're listening to WABC. This is the More Money Show. This is More Money with economist Steve Moore. Now, Steve Moore. Welcome back, folks. This is the More Money Show on WABC Radio. We're talking about the economy. We're talking about money. We're talking about politics. We're talking about how you can make more money. And so uh, one of the regulars on this show for the last couple of months has been John McLaughlin. I'd love to bring John on. You all know John. He's one of the premier pollsters in the country. Uh, he has a finger on the pulse of what Americans are thinking, what they're saying, and uh, what's happening with this election. John, thanks again. And I promised I'd only keep you for about 10 minutes for your latest update. But uh, thanks again for taking some time off on a Saturday afternoon. Thank you. And congratulations on your book that's out there with the, uh, <laughs> Thank the you. economy. It's a great book. No, seriously. Thank you. Well, Donald Trump held it up the other day at his rally and said, everybody's got to get this book. Uh, you know, the uh, Trump economic miracle. So there's a lot of great data in there. Okay, John, um, we uh, this is going to kind of be a speed interview because there's so much I want to ask you about. Yes. But obviously, first of all, I made my point in the, uh, my opening statement for the show was that Trump has big mo right now. And uh, I, I feel it, you know, having been around him a little bit I in going to some of the rallies and going to events around the country, it just feels like there's been a momentum shift but am I just dreaming this, or do you are you seeing that in the polls? No, there's definitely a momentum shift. And uh, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm not used to this. Having worked for Donald Trump in 2016, when they told us there was a Hillary lock, at this right. point in time in 2016, we were down seven or eight <laughs> points in the real clear politics average, losing every battleground state. And then in 2020, remember the Biden blue wave? He was ahead mm -hmm. of us by 10 points today. There were polls mm -hmm. out. On Halloween and right before the election, we were down 10, 11 points uh, in the national polls, and we were losing every battleground state. And out of a record 160 million votes that were cast in 2020, we lost by only 44,000 votes in three states, 12,000 in Arizona, Georgia, and in uh, uh, 20,000 in Wisconsin. So, you know, those two elections at this point in time, I kept arguing we could win a close election and it was going to be decided by the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. And right now you still have a very close election, but the national polls are a dead heat. 
and we're not used to this where where we're you know we're in a dead heat among, in the popular vote so there is the possibility that Donald Trump could actually win the popular vote if we have another good 17 days but things can really change because they're volatile in the battleground states where we are slightly ahead in all the battleground states right now, which would mean that when you go to like the real clear politics average of these media polls, which we're seeing the same thing in the in the campaign's internal polls, we would have 312 electoral votes. We're mm-hmm. only at 270. By the way, if you take the polls outside, you know, if you say, look, all these polls are margin of error. They, you know, we're up by a point here, two points there, et cetera. And the margin of error of these polls is usually three or four percent plus or minus if you take them out we're only at 219 electoral votes and harris is at 215 and there's 104 electoral votes in toss-up just like they were in 2016 and you've got arizona georgia michigan minnesota nevada north carolina pennsylvania wisconsin and the the one electoral vote in the second congressional in nebraska They're yep. all too close to call, but we're on the upside. We're ahead in those areas. So, so mm-hmm. let me ask you this, uh, John. Um, that's a great uh, overview of where the things stand. Thank you. Right, that's coming from John McLaughlin, the expert, the uh, pollster who's who's uh, following this stuff every day. Um, one of the things that struck me, John, and I don't know if this came from one of your polls or another one, but. Uh, uh, and forgive me if I've got these numbers wrong, but roughly two or three weeks ago, uh, you know, Kamala Harris had a had a positive. Pe- people viewed her positively. I think she was slightly above. I think it was like forty two percent positive and like forty points negative. I don't know. Remember the exact number, but she was slight positive on her approval rating. I was looking at the latest approval ratings. Now she's da- she her approval rating is actually negative six. Uh, right. According to the poll that I saw, which is a big swing, if you look, you know, in just the last few weeks, why do you? But, but are those numbers pretty close to being accurate? And if they are, why do you think that the public has uh, maybe changed their opinion a bit about Kamala Harris? Well, remember they were running a vibe election. You know, it was all about the vibes that she was, she was going to be this right. change candidate. But we now said, you know, look. She's she went a, a week ago Monday. She was back on. She was on the View, and she, they said, "Would you have done anything differently over the last four years right, that you and right. Joe Biden did?" And she said, "Not one thing." Well, and America is yeah. saying, "Right." She people didn't know where she stood. People really didn't have a focus on her. And from the time she got picked on July twenty first until this day she's getting over 90 yep. percent positive press from the mainstream media 90 yep. percent no it's over you just asked Brent Bozell at the media research center it's 90 that nonpartisan. yes group, i saw that study you're right you're right i thought it was like 88 percent but still it's <laughs> pretty close to 90 percent and and it's and for donald trump who survived an assassin's bullet and uh it's over 90 percent negative from that right so, right but but the campaign on its own, to Donald Trump's credit, he's he's working tirelessly. He's out hustling her. He's out there doing rallies. He's in the battleground states. He's doing a ton of media. They've hit her from the press. Anything yes. that's anything that could be tough. But we've gotten the message out that if you want to change things, if you want to get the country back in the right direction, if you want a pro growth economy, you have to vote for Donald Trump because she's gonna she, she's gonna let those tax cuts that you help create lapse. It'll be a five trillion dollar tax increase, and raising taxes on ninety one percent of all Americans. The, our, our ads in the battleground states say it's up. Mm-hmm. It'll raise taxes twenty six hundred dollars on the average yeah, person. Yep, yep. And and if you want an open border, if you want to still have this crime, if you want to have endless wars, you know that's her. It's all on her. So your opening point that. Trump has a positive job approval among all voters. They may not like his personality. They may not like his style mm-hmm. or his tweets, or, but he was great at the Al Smith dinner the other night. But no. but they may not like him personally, but he has a net positive job rating because people said inflation was low. The border was secure. Uh, we weren't in, we were winning. What We beat ISIS. We, we weren't in endless wars. America was safer no. and more prosperous. Under Kamala Harris, they're getting a picture now. You'll have four more years of high inflation, government spending, yes. higher taxes, open borders. Uh, 
they're getting a picture of who she would really be as president. Yeah. And so I saw this ad, I saw this poll the other day. Again, I don't know if it was yours or someone else's, but it showed uh, it was a large number over uh, over 70 percent said they think the country's headed in the wrong direction. And I know, you know, people are oftentimes just normally pessimistic, but that's a big number. And it's hard to see the incumbent, and let's face it, Kamala is sort of running as the incumbent in this race, winning with a number, with if, if Americans really, if, if, if almost over two-thirds of Americans think the country, are you seeing that too, that people are just stressed out? Yes, and, and but they have to understand she's Joe Biden's vice president. Yeah. They tried to say she was somebody different and, right. and that she's not Joe Biden. She's she's younger than Joe Biden, but she's she's lockstep totally in the same policy position. Right. Right. So, so I mean, so uh, to, to you and me, here. John, that's so self-evident. But I guess we're, I guess a lot of people still are thinking of her as a kind of separate. I mean, they are they are they are joined at the hip. I mean, she can't name one policy, one policy right. that would be different from what. Joe Biden did. So how can the American people, how can so many people still think that she's going to be different from Biden? I mean, I actually think she's going to be worse, but um, I'm surprised that people still think she's going to be this you know, bright ray of sunshine and that it's turning the page. I mean, turn the page from, from what to what? Right. Well, the difference is, you know, if they don't listen to you on ABC radio, if they don't, <laughs> uh, if they don't watch Fox news or Newsmax or et cetera, they're getting a totally different alternative universe on CNN and MSNBC. Or if there's somebody who doesn't care about politics and tune in late between big tech and big media with their bias, yeah. uh, they're not getting that message. So it's been up to the campaign and Donald Trump to go us to go out, hustle them, which Donald Trump is doing. And, and you saw it the other night at the Al Smith dinner. Donald Trump was funny. He was personable. He was yep. humble. And yep. he, and he was he you know he was able to get in a room where a lot of those people there were Democrats for New York City. Yes, and he won them over. He was he was and she she insulted Catholics by not coming. And, yeah, I was uh, not there, but we you know I I saw I watched a lot of it, and I couldn't agree more with you that Trump came across as he you know I you were used the word humble. That's not something we normally associate with Donald Trump, but he was self effacing and mm-hmm. you know. I thought, you know, humor is such a powerful tool in politics. And I was glad to see that Trump, you know, pulled that off so effectively. And I, I could not believe how piss poor uh, the the dial it in um, performance by Kamala was. Couldn't they think of anything funny to say? No. But look, for those of us who know her record, she tried to put a litmus test that she wouldn't allow practicing Catholics to be on the federal court. Yeah, right. You know, I mean, we know what she grilled people for being in the Knights of Columbus, which is a charitable organization. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. Right. But that's how radical she is. So people are seeing she's radical that she would have, you know, she supports transgender surgeries and having taxpayers pay for them. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, she doesn't like Catholics and or, you know, so you're dealing with somebody who's really way out of the mainstream yeah. when voters get a focus on that. And, you know, Donald Trump, I, we've known him for years. He's more determined than ever. He's a better candidate than ever. He's an experienced president who will yes. use that experience to do better this term than he did in his last term. I agree. You know? And by the way, John, the uh, the Wall Street Journal interview, I don't know if you read it, uh, mm-hmm. but um, they 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 agreed that you know even though the journal editorial page has some you know policy disagreements some some you know some on tariffs severe policy disagreements they did say look this guy knows his stuff he is ready yeah. he is of sound mind he is he has the executive experience and they were quite impressed with um you know with again how he carried himself how much he knew about the issues um and that's what you want in the chief executive right yes and he is he can solve the problems the country's going through right now. He can secure the border. He can, you know, restore us to back to low inflation and a yep. pro-growth economy. He can keep us safe and secure in a dangerous world. I mean, they tried to put my other client besides Trump, Netanyahu. I've worked for Netanyahu for years. They tried to blow up his house with a drone. Why haven't we shut the satellites down that, mm-hmm. you know, Iran and Hezbollah are using you know, to, to, to navigate their drones to attack Israel. This is like crazy. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so John, you know, we just have about a minute, minute and a half left. Uh, last question. I think I asked you this the last time you were on, but I'd like to re- ask the question again because that was a couple weeks ago. What what is what is Trump's closing argument? We're getting close to the end here. What does Trump need to do over the next uh, fourteen days or so to seal the deal? For us, for us old timers who uh, used to work for Ronald Reagan, it's very easy. It's like. You know, do you want four more years of the same uh, right. failed policies? Right. Or, or, you know, are you better off today than you were four years ago? Of course not. If you yeah. want to be better off, you have to vote for change and vote for Donald Trump. It's very simple. John, you're the best. Thank you so much. I'd like to, I'd love to call on you in a couple of weeks, right before the election, and get your pre election uh, forecast on things. Um, that's John McLaughlin, one of the great pollsters in America. This is the More Money Show on WABC. We'll be right back. It's more money with leading economist Steve Moore. Stephen Moore is with us, economist. With more than 30 years experience as an economist and as a leading thinker of government on business, showing deep understanding of the shifts in the global economy. He's leading economist Steve Moore with more money on Talk Radio 77 WABC. Now, here's your host, Steve Moore. Welcome back, folks. This is the More Money Show. By the way, I will be taking you. We're live. We're in color. If you if you dial, don't change the dial. But if you did, you just hear boring infomercials on most every other channel. We're live. We have the best guests in the country, uh, and one of them is coming up uh, right now, and that is David Stockman, who's somebody I've been admired for forty years. He was one of the original Reaganites uh, at the start of the Reagan Revolution. Uh, had worked for Jack Kemp. Uh, was Reagan's budget director, put out some of the best budgets ever, uh, made a great play at uh, cutting our budget. Sometimes he didn't win those fights. A lot of times he didn't. But uh, now he is, I call him the Pied Piper of fiscal sanity in America. And that's David Stockman. David, thanks so much for joining. Great to be with you, Steve. And uh, it's true, you know, back in 1981, when we took a real uh, run at uh, shrinking the budget for the first time really in decades, I mentioned this because the problem we inherited from Jimmy Carter was a one trillion public debt. It yep. was thirty one percent of GDP. Yeah. We're about ready finally to get rid of Biden and uh, the number is gonna be thirty six trillion <laughs> and hundred and twenty five percent of GDP. Oh now, my god. You know, we, we are kind of uh graying in the years, but we haven't been around that long. You know, that's forty four years. And we've had this massive uh, increase in the public debt, not just the number, but the burden on the GDP. So I think that's the core issue that somehow the government has to address. And neither candidate, unfortunately, is doing it. That's the problem. So before we get further into the debt issue, and that's why I wanted to bring you on, but, you know, you – you, we we Reaganites, and I, I worked for Reagan at the very end of his presidency. You were there at the beginning, but, you know, we're dying off. You know, that was a long time yeah. ago. And yeah. I just wonder, you know, you were in the Oval Office many times with the, with uh, Ronald Reagan. You know, what, what are some of your memories of, of the Gipper and what kind of a president was he? Well, first of all, he was the most economically literate knowledgeable, historically um, educated president uh, we've had in modern times. Uh, wow. He actually knew what happened in the 1920s and the 1930s <laughs> and the post-war period and could cite, uh, you know, yeah. economists that uh, most uh, uh, politicians yeah. never heard of. But, but wait a minute, David, do you remember back when he was running? Remember, they, they said he's just a grade B actor. He doesn't know anything about policy. Remember that? Yeah, I know. They said that he can read a script, but that wasn't true. You know, <laughs> He really understood. And so, therefore, one of the great things that happened during his administration was we inherited double-digit inflation. Interest rates were 16, 17 percent. Right. I on, remember. On the 10-year, yep. uh, 20. People can't believe that nowadays. 20 percent on the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, prime rate. And uh, Volcker did a tremendously uh, courageous thing when he said this can't stand 
he really threw on the brakes. The economy did suffer pretty badly in 81 and 82. And my point is, all the Republican, even Republican politicians at the time said, this has got to stop. You've got to, you know, attack right. uh, Volcker and uh, we, we can't live with this. And Reagan said, no, we inherited double digit inflation. It was because of too much money printing, too much deficit. I'll work on the deficit. Let uh, Volcker work on the money printing. And right. sure enough, by early 83, the inflation rate was down to two and a half, three percent. I know. The economy, I uh, yep. You know, the economy got up off its uh, hind legs and took off. And we had a prosperity spurt, you know, for the mid 80s and through the end of the decade, right. like we haven't had since. So if it hadn't been for his historical knowledge and his mm -hmm. real uh, philosophical commitment to sound money, I'm sure the typical Republican president, say Bush had been elected then, they would have been all over Volcker. And I don't know if they ever would have gotten inflation yeah. uh, tamed. I agree with you. I think, I think Paul Vol Volcker and Reagan uh, broke the back of inflation, which was one of the greatest you know, uh, economic achievements. And I, I couldn't agree more. And I was you know, in high school, I think, when uh, when uh, we had those high inflation rates. But boy, I remember it. I mean, literally every time you'd go to the to the I don't know if I ever told you the story, but I was working as a grocery store clerk and I have to keep coming in and put stickers of higher prices on every week because the inflation yeah. was so high. Exactly. Uh, you know, so uh, at the time, at the time, uh, see, before I went into the Reagan administration, I was a congressman from Michigan. And yeah. I was home every week. And this is at a time when, uh, you know, mortgage rates were in the mid teens. Uh, when grocery prices were rising uh, at 12, 13, 15 percent annual rates. And boy, people let you know that they couldn't yeah. live with that and that Washington needed to really, you know, change directions dramatically. So right. uh, the, the system will respond uh, if things get bad enough. Unfortunately, right now, Yes. Uh, you know, we're kind of drifting along and stumbling along. We did get rid of the 9% inflation. It's still 3 to 4%, still way too high. Um, but uh, the Fed starts another rate cutting cycle when we haven't even beat the I know. inflation from last time. And so uh, it's not only that, but I think there's an important thing people need to understand. The reason we have these tremendous deficits, and, you know, we just finished the year. The numbers were out a couple of days ago, $1.8 trillion at yes. a time, new, new debt at a time when allegedly we we're at full employment. Now, that, that was, you know, six and a half percent of GDP, a yeah. deficit that big at full employment. It's only going to get bigger as we go forward. In fact, we could get into some of those numbers. They're terrible. But the point is, if the Fed had not printed so much money over the last two decades, we wouldn't have had deficits of this magnitude yep, because yep. interest rates would have been pushed up. It would have been a signal to politicians. They would have heard a lot of uh, very anguished uh, cries right. from back home to stop this. This is how it used to work. But once the Fed went into what you know we call the monetization business, monetizing yep. the debt, yep. Uh, the politicians uh, didn't hear uh, from uh, the bond vigilantes, so to speak. So, David, your your yeah, your book, yeah, your book uh, that you wrote, which I, I've always said is a uh, every single political science major at every university should read, which was uh, the first book that you wrote, which is of course called the about your Reagan years, and it's called yeah, The Triumph yeah. of Politics, a fantastic, fantastic book. You talk about, I remember reading that when I was about 23 years old, and, and, and I was just, my eyes just burst open. You know, we think that Republicans want to cut spending, you know, and that it's these big liberal Democrats. Now, the big liberal Democrats do like to spend money. But what I learned from your book is that Republicans like to spend money, too. Yeah, that, that was the problem. You know, we were trying to say, look, food stamps are out of control. We have got to sharply curtail and tighten eligibility and all the other things we right. did because uh, that, uh, you know, we can't spend that kind of money. But also, why do we have the Export-Import Bank? All the money's going right. to General Electric and Boeing. Right, right. Giant 
companies right. with huge market caps, they should be able to fund their own export sales. But when it came to push came to shove, they didn't want to cut export import bank. I'm talking about Republicans now. And then we got to farm subsidies and mm -hmm. we said, you know, we, let, we believe in free markets. Let the price of wheat find its uh, natural yeah. level in the world market and so forth. They didn't want to cut the farm subsidies and right. they didn't want to cut a lot of the pork barrel projects going back home for rivers and harbors and, you know, all the rest of it. So, and then the other thing, unfortunately, and there's a lot of disagreement in the Republican Party, but uh, the defense budget just took off. You know, right. Jimmy Carter's right. budget was $140 billion, was $350 billion by the time uh, Reagan finished, and we spent so much on defense that everything that uh, we saved on the domestic side got reallocated to defense. And pretty soon you couldn't find a corporal's guard of Republicans in the House, mm -hmm. even some of the stout anti-spenders who were willing to walk the plank because they said, well, you know, it's just going uh, to the yeah. that big uh, pork barrel and uh, DOD and, uh, you know, what's the point? So that's the problem <laughs> we have today, too. It's a big problem so today. I'm talking to David Stockman, who was Ronald Reagan's first budget director, put together probably one of the great budget uh, proposals of all time. And I'm thinking, you know, here we are uh, more than 40 years after you put those budgets together about cutting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of wasteful programs. You mentioned uh, the Export Import Bank, a lot of the farm subsidies, li or legal services corporation, money to the yes. Corporation for Public Broadcast. I mean, and, and you know what's so disheartening, David, is here we are 40 years later, and those programs have the bigger budgets than ever before. Exactly right. In fact, even some of them that we were we managed to curtail, like, uh, you know, subsidies for the arts and humanities, right. uh, even those have grown back to where they were. Yeah. And then some I'm talking about even in adjusted for inflation. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a serious problem. But I think people always have to remember that if we don't have a central bank making it too easy yes, for the politicians, right. By monetizing the debt, if we let the free market push right. interest rates, you know, to a market clearing level, these politicians would wake up. You know, back in 1981, 82, a lot of the Republican mainstream senators, we called them, as you might remember, the old bulls or the College of Cardinals. They they believed in tax cuts, but they were afraid that it would cause too big a deficit. And they were about yeah. as anti-deficit as they come. That was then. But uh, today, uh, you know, you can't find a, a corporal guard or Republicans yeah. that want to do much deficit cutting either. No, they won't. They just I mean, the Republicans just passed, uh, you know, a continuing resolution to just, you know, uh, kick the can into the next year. And, and so what do we do, David? I mean, you know, you and I have been fiscal warriors for years and yeah. years and years, and uh, we're running bigger deficits than ever before. Um, and I don't know how, when are we going to re well, you know, Reagan used to say that the, you know, closest thing to immortality on this, this earth is a federal government program. Yeah. And I think yeah. he's been kind of proven correct about that, but what is the strategy? How do we do it? How do we, re we did balance the budget at the end of the Clinton administration, but since then runaway deficits. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's a, um, I would, obviously, you can't give up the ghost, you can't give up the fight, but also, I think we have to do much better job of demonstrating to people that reform, uh, ironically, has to start at the Federal Reserve. Until we get the Federal Reserve out of yes. the bond market, out of, you know, these massive yes. purchases of government debt, week after week, month after month, we're not going to be able to sober up the politicians politically. And I know that if they have to finance the deficit honestly in the bond market, drive yep. up interest rates, hurt homeowner, uh, mortgage borrowers back home or small businesses, the political system uh, finds countervailing forces against spending and against borrowing. So, you know, ironically, the the route uh, to sobriety fiscally and, and stopping this, uh, you know, death spiral that we're in uh, will be uh, root and branch reform at the Federal Reserve. And, you know, yeah. maybe uh, that that's the next chapter that we really need to work on. So uh, 
you you're a little more um uh, apocalyptic about the debt than I am, but we're both extremely concerned about it. So what do you, if we don't do something about this, how, how is, I mean, I don't see how this story can have a happy ending. What, what will happen if we continue to, to, you know, if you look oh. at the Biden baseline, they want to borrow $2 trillion a year from now until forever. Yes, that's, that's an important point. Right now we're stuck in a de- uh, fiscal policy that says, well, we'll take about 18% of GDP in taxes, but we're going to spend 25% of GDP right. or more. That's right. a 7% gap, but it's not stable because what we learned this year is that if you have to have even quasi-normal interest rates, which we've <laughs> been having now for the last year and a half, interest on the public debt is going to soar. We we had uh, interest in the year just ended of one point one trillion, which was 23 percent of every dollar of revenue that came in went to paying interest on the debt. So we're in danger of what, you know, is called a debt interest spiral, Mm -hmm. because if we uh, don't do something about this gap, the 7 percent, 25 spending, 18 uh, revenue, uh, it's it's just going to um, soar. Now, I, I can give you a number that just tells you how crazy this is. But uh, we're heading under existing policy if nothing changes, same revenue, same spending. Yep. We're yep. heading to $150 trillion public debt by mid-century. <laughs> oh, that's uh, okay, that, I mean, that's no, no, insanity. No, that, 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 that's a 1.5 yeah. times the GDP God. of the entire planet <clears throat> Earth, okay, if you want Jesus. a big number. I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, it's going to crash. I mean, we cannot we yeah. cannot continue yeah. to do what you're doing. I'm so um, I, we're fortunate that we have someone like you educating us about the dangers that lie ahead. David Stock. David, by the way, what's your latest book? Uh, well, uh, the latest book that I uh, wrote was uh, it's called Trump's War on Capitalism. And it's basically trying to show that even under Donald Trump and the Republicans, mm-hmm. they did nothing about really uh, reducing the fiscal situation that's out of mm-hmm. control, as well as the whole regulatory uh, apparatus yeah. on the economy. They talked about regulation, but they didn't do much. So yeah. if we don't get um, you know, the fiscal burden off the economy and the regulatory burden off the economy, we're not going to get the kind of growth we need to even – you know, keep up with the what, what yeah. uh, uh, CBO is now forecasting. Anyway, well, that's Dave. But I, I, Dave for- I write about this, Steve, every day in a newsletter I put out called David Stockman's Contra Corner. And oh, how do people get up- that? Uh, you can just Google it. Uh, you'll find it. Uh, David Sockman. Okay. On the, well, it's good stuff, uh, David. We go around a t- uh, hard break. So, th- so thankful and and appreciative that you take some time off on a Saturday afternoon to educate us about the fiscal crisis that we're in. I think everybody knows it. It's a question of whether we're going to grow up and do something about it. And thank goodness we have warriors like you folks. This is the more money show. We'll be right back. This is more money with economist, Steve Moore. Now, Steve Moore. Welcome back, folks. This is the More Money Show. Boy, uh, that was a sobering story, wasn't it, that David Stockman had to tell. Uh, I do want you all, you know, if everybody should read his book, The Prime for Politics, and it shows why it's so hard to cut our budget. Uh, I disagree with David on one thing. I do think if we get Donald Trump in, I think he's going to grow the economy. When you grow the economy through supply side policies like his tax reductions, deregulations, pro-American energy policies, that increases output. That means your tax base is bigger. You collect more revenues. And I think he's going to be much tougher on the budget this time around. He was not very tough on the budget in his first term. And that's why we had big deficits. And then Biden, of course, came in and doubled those deficits. But I, I think you're going to see a much more fiscally conscientious administration in the tr- second Trump term. I really do. And I've talked to President Trump about this. He gets it. He understands that this is a clear and present danger. Um, and I think you're going to see <laughs> real 
reductions in government spending. Uh, I love the idea of the Elon Musk um, uh, commission on efficiency and redundancy. You know, I was talking to David Stockman about all these programs, hundreds and hundreds of programs that don't do anything. They're obsolete. They're redundant. They're ineffective. And we can't get rid of them. We cannot, you know, we have all of these Oh, subsidy programs that have been going on for sometimes a hundred years and their mission was accomplished or, you know, has been outdated for all of this period. And we keep spending and spending and spending on these things. So I'm here to tell you, I do think we're going to have a new, uh, a new mission in Washington to bring down this out of control spending and debt. And now I want to turn to two of the best in the business on the financial affairs of this country, they are going to tell you why it is and how it is that you should be investing in the market. And uh, we will hear from them right now. Talk Radio 77 WABC. Hey, it's Ryan Payne. It's Bob Payne at Payne Capital Management. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E here on the More Money Show. Every weekend, we're talking about the markets. We're talking about the economy and how it affects your retirement. And Bob, we eked out you know, some positive returns this week in the market. And I would say overall economic data, well, you know, was for the most part pretty good. Yeah, but it's amazing, Rye. You had a, a, a very slight increase in the CPI. And my goodness gracious, I'm watching CNBC and Fox Business and, and the announcer's hair's on fire. You know, it's like the Fed can't cut rates now. The inflation's out of control. I mean, we were at 9.1% a couple, you know, <laughs> not that long ago. Yeah, no, it's crazy, right? It came in at 3.4% on an annualized basis versus 3.3%. <laughs> Are we splitting yes. hairs here? And meanwhile, if you look at it last year this time, we were at 6.5%. So exactly. I think the bottom line is, when we took the big pictures, inflation's been cut in half over the last 12 months. And I think what was really interesting is it was the first time uh, really, in two years, that wages actually outpaced inflation, and that's a really important point because one of the biggest problems the last two years, and you know, people talk about Bidenomics, is that inflation is up way more than wages are, and now that's starting to turn. And if that continues, which we think it will, that bodes very, very well for the economy moving forward. Yeah. Meanwhile, you know, we have the futures market to look at, where professional investors kind of place their bets, and right now you've got two cuts predicted by July with almost 100% certainty and three cuts, you know, by June. So, you know, the Federal Reserve could be cutting rates, which means, you know, interest rates are coming down, which is good for everybody. That's kind of a tax cut for everyone. Meanwhile, oil has been very low. And I think I think what really blows people's minds, Rai, is that oil is low because we're producing more of it than ever as a country. No, that's exactly right. And even if they're making cuts over in the Middle East, uh, we just keep making up for it. <laughs> so it keeps yeah. the price low. Saudi Arabia doesn't like us right now. Um, but to your point, I mean, that, that is a global tax break for everybody when oil prices come down like they have over the course of the last year. And, you know, if you look out into the future again, you look at wages and you look at spending, um, you know, it certainly has been strong last year and probably will be strong going into this year. In fact, one of the reasons that inflation number was so strong is because people were spending money in December during the holidays. They were spending at a record pace. Well, when you have strong employment and you have uh, infl wages going up, that means more spending, which means more profits, you know, more resilient GDP. So when you look at the estimates for earnings, first of all, I don't know, a lot of folks don't realize that we just had an all-time record quarter in earnings in third quarter of this last year, best quarter ever. And the estimates, you know, for the next three quarters are even higher, right? So when Price, you know, when you have uh, stock prices go up, when earnings go up, and right now earnings are headed higher. That's exactly right. In fact, the banks uh, were at an all-time record high. J.P. Morgan had its best year ever in profits, uh, <laughs> finishing out. They reported on Friday, and I thought it was interesting too. Is Wells Fargo came out and said the average deposit that people had at the bank are higher than they were before the pandemic. <laughs> So, you know, overall, I think there's this misconception that all the money has been spent in people's accounts. They're down to the wire now, and that's going to be a problem this year. But the reality of it is there still is plenty of cash. People still do have cash sitting in money market funds. They have it sitting places where they're actually getting a yield on it. 
and they're starting to see their wages continue to, to climb, this is a really good combination. This is probably not a recession <laughs> based on the data that we're seeing right now. And that's really a good message, right? Because I know over the holidays when I spoke with friends and family, they're all very skeptical, right? Very kind of negative. And, you know, we just had, um, you know, the U.S. and its allies retaliate over in the Red Sea because they're attacking shipping. And, you know, immediately my, my friends and even my, some of my family members are saying to me, oh, there goes inflation again. You know, all the costs are going to go up. We're going to have supply chain disruptions. Look what's happening. You know, so it's, it's so easy, you know, because we, you know, we've been through volatile times you know, to, to kind of tend to, to look at things negatively. But, you know, I think we're going to have some volatility this year. We have an election. We have geopolitical uncertainty. But, you know, that's that's always that wall of worry that the market climbs. So use that volatility, right, to, to take advantage of it. Don't fear it. Well, there's a great irony in that, right? Because when you have an election year, typically um, you have a lot of gridlock. Politicians yep. don't want to do anything. They want to go out there on the road, make sure they get reelected, and no real significant – uh, policy gets passed, and markets love that. In fact, markets are up over 80% of the time in an election year because gridlock is so strong in a year like this. So even when you're feeling the emotions of who's going to be in office, the reality of it is nothing's really getting done. I don't know, Ryan. It sounds like you don't have a lot of trust and in, in, in confidence in our elected <laughs> officials. <laughs> well, I think the key this year is going to be focus on what your long-term goals are and invest towards that, not based on what the, you know, the, the political environment is going to be over the course of the next couple of months. And it's going to be tricky because right now you might be sitting in cash. Again, we talked about that. You're getting that 5%, but we know you just mentioned these Fed cuts are coming. That 5% is going away. Uh, you might be thinking to yourself, well, the market was up big last year. You might feel skeptical right now that, well, maybe I missed the boat. But the reality of it is if you actually allocate your money correctly right now, there's still plenty of opportunity to set yourself up for retirement and structure your portfolio correctly. You can't just sit in cash with your sitting on your hands, uh, you know, waiting for some sort of sign here. You've got to be proactive. No, that's absolutely correct, right? Because, you know, the biggest risk every single listener right now is facing is inflation. Now, we've had really high inflation recently, and it's coming down, right? 3.4% better than nine, but still. You have 3% inflation every year for the rest of your life. You need your money to grow. And if you're sitting in cash right now or sitting in short-term treasuries and CDs thinking, wow, I'm getting 5%, I'm really in good shape, you really aren't because that's not investing. That's waiting to invest. And I got to tell you, I've been doing this almost 50 years. I've never heard a bell ring. I never heard saw anybody wave a flag <laughs> going, Bob, get in now. Hurry, hurry. It's time, <laughs> right? It's, it's always yeah. time if you're invested based on your goals and you got to be in the right assets right now, right? So critical. Yeah, it really is. And if you're thinking to yourself right now, okay, I got to get my plan in place. I've been sitting with way too much money in cash. I'm nervous about the political environment moving forward here. I'm not sure what to do. Well, here's your shot to get that full holistic review. Make sure you're set up for retirement. If you're retired now or planning to retire, we keep 10 slots open for the entire show. If you saved over a million dollars for your retirement, Bob and I will run for your total financial master plan. We'll do it with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal, give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll just hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's that income plan for retirement. How do you draw off Social Security? There's lots of ways to take it. One right way for you. How do you pull from your portfolio? in the most tax efficient manner. How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan so you don't run out of money. We're gonna look at diversification. Markets have been all over the place over the course of the last two years. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals, but make sure that you protect the downside so you're protected over the rest of your retirement. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get Bob and I's full tax playbook. We've got 10 slots if you saved over a million dollars for your retirement. All you have to do is text or call 844-752-6692. That's 844-752-6692. Or just simply give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 
P-L-A-N-N-Y-C. If you're one of our next 10 callers, you've saved over a million dollars for your retirement. Our team of financial advisors and certified financial planners will help you to construct a plan, a unique financial plan based on your goals at no cost. But if you don't call, you won't have a plan. 844-752-6692. That's 844-752-6692. Or just give us a call at 844-PLAN-NYC. That's 844-PLAN-NYC. It's more money with leading economist Steve Moore. Stephen Moore is with us, economist. With more than 30 years experience as an economist and as a leading thinker of government on business, showing deep understanding of the shifts in the global economy. He's leading economist Steve Moore with more money on Talk Radio 77 WABC. Now, here's your host, Steve Moore. Welcome back, folks. This is the second hour of the more money show thanks so much for sticking with us uh we are on every saturday afternoon from 1 to 3 p.m we are live and we are in color and we are uh going to be taking your callers in just about 20 minutes or so i've allocated a big amount of time because i want to hear from you all about how you feel about the direction of the country I want to hear from people who favor Kamala Harris. I want to have a, a you know wide ranging discussion about why, if you do, you think that Kamala Harris would be a better, better president? Would she be better on the economy? Would she be better on the social issues? Would she be a better commander in chief? I, I really want to hear in a respectful way what you have to say. I learn so much from our listeners. I always say that we have the smartest listeners in the country, which is an amazing thing, but I, uh, I love to hear from you. I love to hear your opinions and I love to hear your facts as well. And so we will be doing that. I want to remind you all of the more money hotline number one 800 848 nine two two two. I believe Christian, is that the right number? Yeah. one 800 I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me say that again. 1-800-848-9222 or 1-800-848-WABC. So uh, I want to hear from you about the economy. I want to hear from you about, you know, what, what, here's another one I want to ask you about. I had a fascinating conversation on the previous hour with David Stockman, who was Ronald Reagan's first budget director. And he was talking about how hard it is to cut government spending. I don't know why it is, but it's just, it's like pulling teeth trying to get Congress Republicans or Democrats to cut even the most wasteful spending programs. I wonder if you all have good ideas about programs we could eliminate. You know, what is it in the budget? We, we have to we're going to have to eliminate hundreds and hundreds of programs. I mean, we're spending two trillion dollars more than we bring in and we can raise revenues through growth. But we also are going to have to take a hatchet to the budget. And I want to hear if you have any good ideas of programs you think we could live without. I'll give you one idea. Let's just get rid of foreign aid. I mean, we, we're running a two trillion dollar deficit. We don't have free money being passing out to other countries. And I'm not so sure that any of this foreign aid is actually helping the countries it's supposed to help. And even the money to Ukraine, I don't even know how much of that money you've, that we've got hundreds of billions of dollars. How much of it is actually getting to the Ukrainians? We don't even know the answer to that. You know, they never audit these programs. They don't tell us where the money went. They just said, you know, it's like, oh, we'll just assume that the money went to the people we thought it would uh, when it gets intercepted by these big beltway band-aids. Uh, I, I, I'm just disgusted by it, frankly. And when I was talking to David Stockman earlier, I was mentioning that he looked at programs that were obsolete 40 years ago. He had recommended getting rid of those. And here we are 40 years later. We still have these programs. <laughs> they were, We didn't need them 40 years ago. We still need them. I mean, we still have them. We're still funding them at bigger budgets than ever. But I would get rid of foreign aid. I would close down the U.S. Department of Education and I'd save some of the money. And then the other money I would just give to parents and let them choose the best schools for their kids. I would eliminate the Department of Energy. I mean, what has the Department of Energy ever done? So tell me one good thing the Department of Energy has done. It's, it's actually held up our energy production in this country. Um, I don't think we need 400 regulatory agencies, 400 regulatory agencies making rules and regulations. We don't know, even know who these people are. They were never elected to anyone. So I want to hear if you have any thoughts about 
programs that we no longer need. I'm going to uh, interview my good friend, Norm Champ, in a minute. He is somebody I've been really eager to talk to again. He was on the show about a month and a half ago, and I heard so much positive feedback from when he was on, I I wanted to bring him on again. And the issue that I'm going to talk to Norm Champ about is this new policy that has been implemented by the Securities and Exchange Commission to monitor and to keep track of every single stock transaction that every single American makes. I think it's outrageous. I think it's a violation of our rights of privacy and our Fourth Amendment rights of against uh, uh, illegal seizures, searches and seizures. So I'm going to talk to Norm about that in a minute. But I wanted to get to one point before I do, and that is, I hope you're all getting our Unleashed Prosperity hotline every morning. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we talk about this show are uh, stories that we've uncovered in Unleashed Prosperity. By the way, this is this is free. It costs you nothing. Just go to UnleashedProsperity.com, sign up, give us your email. There's no advertising. There's no fee to this. I just want our listeners to be on top of all the hot issues and the scandals that are going on in Washington. Now, here is a scandal that I find to be outrageous. We're Let's see, uh, what are we, 18 or so days before what I think is the most important election since 1980 in this country. And, um, you know, a lot of states are trying to clean up their voting rolls so that only legal people are voting uh, and not people who are illegally registered to vote. Maybe they're not of the right age. You know, maybe they're not actually 18 or maybe they're not a citizen or maybe they have other disqualifying aspects, or maybe they've already registered somewhere else and they're registering twice or three times or four times, or maybe they're not of sound mind, whatever it might be. uh, We want to make sure the people who are voting are eligible to vote. I don't understand why the Democrats are so opposed to that. Every time we say we've got to clean the voting rolls, they say, oh, voter suppression. I don't want to suppress anyone's vote. I don't care if they're black, white, green, yellow. I don't care what color of their skin, what ethnicity. I want people who are eligible to vote to vote. That's your responsibility as a citizen. But think about this. If you have thousands and thousands of people in your district that are not eligible to vote that are voting, what they're doing is they're disenfranchising you. They're taking away your right to vote because they're canceling your vote out. You see what I'm saying? So this is anti-democracy to allow people who are not allowed to vote or not eligible to vote to vote. So my friend Glenn Youngkin, who is the governor of Virginia, did just what I'm talking about. He cleaned out the rolls. He looked at all the people who are registered in Virginia and they found it just first, their first um, go through, they found 6,300 people who were registered to vote that were not eligible, that were not eligible to vote for one reason or another. Either they didn't live in the state or they were not 18 years old or they were not a citizen. And so God bless Glenn Young, and he did a public service. He said, okay, these 6,300 people can't vote because they're not eligible. And the federal government is saying, no, you can't take those people off the voter rolls. I'm serious. The Biden administration said, no, it's you can't do that within 100 days of an election. So they want these people to vote illegally. I'm not going to say that again, folks. You can tell by the tone of my voice I'm angry about this. They want these people who are not eligible to vote to vote, even though we're, we know they're not eligible to vote because of some Byzantine uh, rule they're making up. Uh, I have a feeling that we're going to see a lot of voter fraud this year, and I hope that you all are going to be watching the polls. And uh, if you want to do a service, you know, sign up as a poll watcher and make sure they're not engaging in funny business with the ballots because we want to make sure that this is a clean election. And if Kamala Harris wins in a clean election, I will be sad, I'll be depressed, but I'm not going to I'm not going to revolt in the streets or anything like that. Um but let's make sure that the right candidate who won the most votes and won the most electoral votes is the candidate who is the president of the United States, not someone who gets in because of stolen votes. That's all I'm saying. And The federal government, the Biden administration says, no, you have to allow these people to vote, even though they're not legally entitled to vote. (laughs) I'm just dumbfounded by that. All right. I want to now turn to my friend, Norm Champ. I'm going to calm down for a minute because you can tell I'm really angry about that, folks. I mean, come on. We cannot allow illegal immigrants to vote. We cannot allow people who are not eligible to vote in, to vote in this country. It is it is destroying our democracy, and it is taking away your right to vote when someone votes illegally. 
Okay. So Norm Champ is a good friend of mine. He's I've met him a few years ago. He's one of the world's expert on securities law. He was a member of the Securities Exchange Commission. I hope when Donald Trump wins, he becomes the next chairman of that commission. Uh, Norm, uh, you have a new book out. Um, by the way, thanks again for joining, Norm. Great to be with you. Great to be here, Steve. Uh, great to listen to the program and uh, look forward to talking with you. Okay, so uh, thanks again for coming on. Um, before we get to the issue of the day, tell people about your book because you've been sending me data about how we just don't have enough publicly traded companies anymore because of the regulations and the costs. Yeah, so I have two books out there. They're a little bit older, but one is Going Public, which is about- Yes, that's the one. Like, that's the one yeah. that I read about nine months ago. Great book. Yeah, and that's about you know kind of what it's like to work inside the, one of those 400 agencies that you mentioned. And- and um, just, you know, how there are real challenges in managing um, these agencies because, as you said, of the bureaucracy and the rules they're right. putting out. Um, and so, you know, that really describes that. Mastering Money is about trying – my other book is about, you know, all of us trying to get our personal finances, you know, in order and, and think right. about how to budget wisely. And I think a key part of that is saving for retirement. And you mentioned David Stockman. Think about Ronald Reagan, Steve. The Reagan Revolution and turning retirement, you know, creating the right, mm -hmm. the ERISA Act under Ronald right. Reagan created right. the 401ks and the IRAs. IRAs. The IRAs. Vast, yep. yep. The vast majority of Americans rely on those accounts for their retirement. Yes. And that also gave the vast majority of Americans a stake in U.S. capital markets. That's because, right. Yes. Because those accounts can only invest in liquid security, so primarily public co uh, stocks or you know public forms of debt. And so yes. our big crisis right now is that the number of public companies that those funds, that those accounts can invest in, have declined by half since the 1990s. And the Biden SEC continues to load and load and load disclosure requirements, accounting requirements, lawsuit, you know, being in, enabling yes. people to sue public companies. Right. And it's dwindling the number of investment choices that yes. all of us have in our retirement. By the way, just to, just to interrupt you for one second, my good friend um, who owns uh, Continental Energy uh, is basically he took his company private. You know, it was a public – Continental was a public company. And he said he was so fed up with all the regulations, all the excess costs, all the auditing requirements that he said we can make more money if we uh, – if we uh, if we go private, so you're in. In fact, you know, usually a company, right, Norm, starts private and then it goes public. Now we're seeing companies go the opposite direction. I think it's because of exactly what you've put your finger on: the high cost of going public. Hundred percent, and so much of this is politically driven, Steve. Right, so mandating disclosure by these companies on these political hot topics of the day, you know, um, ESG, uh, you know, pay, pay ratio of the CEO to the frontline worker, those are just political items, right? We've gotten this far as a country with a standard that said all these public companies must disclose what's material. What's material 50 years ago is different than what's material now, and it's different than what it will be 50 years in the future, and it evolves, and it's a standard that grew this country and grew our incredible mm -hmm. wealth that we have in this country, right. and they're ditching that for, oh, you've got to talk about this, you've got to talk about that, and you know, companies, it's very expensive to do that. And if you get it wrong, you get, stu you get sued. Um, and of course, yep. a lot of people settle those suits because they don't want to fight yep. them. So all of this is just piling cost after cost on public companies just when we need them more because yes. all the 401ks and IRAs need to invest in them. So we've got to try. I think that's, the, that's a really critical point that, you know, we all, uh, almost everyone listening to the show has a 401k or a retirement plan or a pension and it's invested in the stock market. But if you have a dwindling number of companies, if it's all Google and Apple and Amazon and, and, and NVIDIA and just a handful of them, you don't have the diversity that you want in your portfolio. And so, by the way, when you were talking about these regulations and edicts that the government's putting on these public companies, do these also include ESG? Like, you know, you have to have, uh, you know, certain people on the board and, you know, uh, quotas and things like that. What kind of what kind of directives are you talking about? So most of the things that I was just mentioning are either in the Dodd-Frank Act, you know, back okay. from post-crisis or yes. 
in rules that have come along since then. The specific board requirements that you're mentioning, those have been imposed by the stock exchanges and approved by the SEC, right? Oh, okay. So there needs to be a close look taken at those stock exchange requirements, right? Because, you know, all these things are so antithetical to the to the health of American retirements. Back to your point on diversity, as I think we've talked about before, the top, the top 10 stocks by market value comprise one-third of the S&P 500 yeah. stock index. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just, so we're, so if, they, we're, if those companies go down, they take the whole stock market down with them. 100%. Uh, yeah. and, we're, and we're really, you know, as you said, risk diversification is a problem, but also access to innovative companies. You know, yes. wouldn't we all like to be able to invest in some new up and coming company, but instead yep. that company says, Hey, I don't want to be out there in the firing line and, and we have to pay for all this disclosure and have people upset with me and so forth. And so it's, it's a, this is a real risk to America. It is. Okay. So I want to get to something that is, has me hopping mad. There's a lot that has me hopping mad, today. <laughs> but one of the things I wanted to ask you about was this story uh, that we reported on on our hotline this week about the SEC now basically snooping on every single stock transaction that every American is making. There must be billions of these and uh, compiling a ma- And again, you know this, this stuff better than I do, but apparently they're building a big database of all who owns what. I don't want the government knowing if I own Microsoft or if I own AT&T or if I own Google or if I'm selling this stock or that stock. I, I just find this to be a very dangerous thing, Norm. And I want your reaction. Are you familiar with this story? Are you familiar with what's going on? And am I exaggerating the dangers of this? Not in the least. Uh, it is something called the Consolidated Audit Trail. And this has been <laughs> I don't like it for, already. <laughs> see, right. Just the name is not great. And this has been going on. This project's been going on literally, I think it's something like a decade. You know, And mm-hmm. these are – and just to tie into what we were talking about, the cost of this project, Steve, yes. is such a burden on our markets. So yep. all yep. these changes are supposed to report all this data. That means all the brokers – well – that those costs translate right into what we were just talking about about the cost of being a public company. So those exchanges are charging more to the public companies to be to, because of this huge project. So it's another factor in what we were discussing about the decline in public companies. The second thing, as you alluded to, what's going to be done with all of that data? Right. So right. Think about the massive amount of that data, and number point three. You know, I was in the government for five years, Steve. The technology inside the government lags the private sector by five to ten years at least. Oh, my God. We're going to have all this data inside, you know, these places, maybe the markets, maybe at the government. The risk of that data being hacked or used by someone or accessed by non, you know, people who aren't friendly to us. You know, a lot of these things are national security issues, right? I agree. Do we really want all of that data somewhere that someone might get into? No. I mean, I, I, the obvious answer to that question is no. And I, I'm i just flabbergasted that this is happening at the SEC. And Norm, I mean, I hope when you become the chairman of the SEC, and I think there's a good chance that you will be, that's one of the reasons uh, I love having you on your show because you're such an expert on these securities issues. And I know, folks, these are kind of mundane issues, but they're really important to your financial privacy and your private, your financial security. And I, th- I, th- I hope that you could just bring an end to this program. I don't think the government needs to know what Dick or Harry or Jane is buying and holding and selling in their stocks. I don't see any public purpose to that. And it's all part of all the things we've been talking about, Steve, which is, okay, the private, the public employees in the state and local level, their pensions are mostly invested in private equity funds, right? Those funds are not available to everybody in the country because they have very high thresholds for how much wealth you have right. to have. What's available to all of us is public stocks. <laughs> and so why, through this consolidated audit trail, all these rule proposals, all these requirements, why the attack on public companies where yeah. all the rest of us need our retirements. It, it's just, yes. it makes we no sense. We own them, sense. yeah, right. It, yeah, exactly, right. I mean, it makes no sense. And as as we've talked about before, so much of this is just 
common sense. Yes. All the all of our fellow Americans are investing in these retirement accounts. Let's make as many investment choices available for them. Let's help them de-risk. Let's help them grow their money so that yes. they have a wonderful retirement. Like, why would we be doing these things? It just defies common sense. So, one last thing on the way out, uh, and this is more of an economic question. I don't know if it's in your wheelhouse, but you know, my friend Jeff Yass and I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal the other day, n- noting the fact that. If you increase the corporate income tax and then you raise, increase the capital gains tax, essentially you're taxing people's stock ownership, obviously, because Americans own the companies. And the higher that, you know, tell me if you think I'm right or wrong on this, that the more that, that the government taxes the corporations, the, the, the less profits that are available to the rest of us. And we all own these companies. So it's going to hurt our 401k plans and our retirement funds. Is that right? Couldn't couldn't agree more. I love your piece. Uh, I I read it with interest, um, and I agree. It's yet another way that they are attacking companies. And and what we need right now, you alluded to it earlier. What we need at this moment is economic growth to help yes. us with these deficits and help us pay down this debt. And something like this, that basically, I mean, I, my I was on a panel once with a tax lawyer, Steve. And he said one thing: it's unalterably true. If you tax something, you have less of it. Less of it. (laughs) That's Norm Champ, folks. Norm, thanks so much. We're up against a hard break. Great, great uh, thoughts and great, great information for us. Folks, we will be right back, and we will be taking your calls. 1-800-848-9222 is the More Money Hotline, and we'll be taking your calls in one minute. Talk Radio 77 WABC. This is More Money with economist Steve Moore. Now, Steve Moore. Welcome back, folks. This is the More Money Show. Uh, We are live and in color, and I appreciate so much people listening in. I had a friend the other day who was driving from all the way from New Jersey to Chicago. You know, that's a long drive. That's like a 10-hour drive. And he said, the whole drive that for the, and I was on the Cudlow show, he said for two and a half hours, I was listening to you and, and uh, Larry Cudlow. So I, I especially appreciate people who listen to the whole show. And um, I wanted to uh, let you know that um, we have listeners all over the country. We have listeners in Georgia. We have uh, listeners in Maine and Vermont. We have listeners in Chicago, in Annapolis. I've even heard from listeners in Phoenix. That's a long way away. We're on many stations, including, obviously, our flagship is WABC. And so I appreciate so much you joining us this uh, Saturday afternoon. By the way, if you're on the East Coast, it is an absolutely gorgeous Saturday afternoon. I hope you all get out and enjoy the sunshine, the fresh air, the beautiful calm winds, the blue skies. Um, I've said so many times since COVID hit, the stupidest thing we ever did during COVID was people keep people locked inside. The best uh, ways to m- remain disease free is to get fresh air, to get exercise, to get sunlight, and uh, to uh, to get all the exercise that you get when you're out running or playing tennis or playing golf or whatever it is. So uh, enjoy this wonderful. It's one of these days you're just you know you just look outside and you're so uh, happy to be alive. And I was driving down the George Washington Parkway this morning. I had been in Orlando the day before, so I was coming back from the airport. And my God, the the uh, foliage is absolutely beautiful. I mean, red and yellow and green and uh, pink, and the colors are just spectacular. So I hope that you have that in the area that you're living in, and I hope that you're getting out and enjoying it. But don't do that until we're done with the show, because now I'm going to get to the most important part of our show. Well, I don't know if it's more important than our great guest, but we have so many smart people on the line. Uh, I will be taking your calls for the next 15 or 20 minutes, folks. So uh, we, my uh, great uh, uh, people who are helping me uh, today on the show, Jackson Avery here in my Washington studio and Christian in New York. Uh, thanks, guys, for uh, for doing this on a Saturday afternoon for me. And I guess, I think you said, Christian, our first caller is Jerry from New Jersey. Yes, sir. Jerry from New Jersey. What do you got, Jerry? Steve, thank you for taking my call. You know, uh, Republicans and conservatives have to somewhere along the line definitively say 
there is no climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Until we do that, you talk about regulations and deficits. Mm -hmm. They will go on for eternity as long as people think that humans can actually change the climate. Humans cannot change the climate. You know, it's not in their pay grade. They have to adjust to the climate. But if we don't attack it head on, we, you know, we attack it by talking about a pipeline or talking about losing 100 jobs or something like that. But until this dogma goes away, forget about your uh, getting rid of regulations. Forget about yeah. doing away with deficits. They will be endless. Yeah. Well, Jerry, uh, you're in New Jersey. What do you do for a living? I'm retired right now. I've been retired since 1997. <laughs> okay, what did you do before you retired? Uh, I worked for Reynolds Aluminum. I was a sales customer service, that okay, kind of got thing. Got it. Well, thank you for calling. I'm going to address your point because I think it is incredibly important, and that is that uh, the, you said it very well. I couldn't say it better. The, we have a government that can't, deliver the mail on time. It can't fix the potholes. It can't keep our border secure. It can't balance the budget. It can't keep crime off the street. It can't uh, direct the money that it spends to the people it's supposed to get to. I mean, we have total incompetence. We had a $40 billion program to try to link up people to the internet and they haven't done a single person yet. I mean, that's the kind of incompetence we have in government. And if they can't do the basic things then how in the world is the United States government going to change the planet's temperature? I mean, the, the absurdity of that notion that somehow through collective government action, we're going to we're going to lower the temperature. Really? You know, we have control over Mother Nature. Um I look the, the temp. I've looked at the data. It is true that over the last um, 80 years or so, the temperature of the planet has warmed by about one degree. And, um, you know, where it goes from here, I don't think, you know, the forecasts are all over the place. We don't know. But what you have is this kind of Armageddon lobby. And what has happened with climate change is, I've said this many times on the show, I will say it again. The green and green energy is about money. It's about the climate change industrial complex. If you had a climate scientist and that climate scientist said, don't worry about this. You know, there's no real climate threat out there. He's not going to get any money. They'd probably get fired from his job. But if he goes out there and says, oh, my God, we're going to melt away in, a, in 50 years. Oh, my God. The, you know, we're going to have tidal waves taking over New York City and knocking down our buildings. And we're going to have, uh, you know all of these, you know, hurricanes and tornadoes and droughts and floods. I mean, I laughed when I watched that debate that uh, that the, the vice presidential debate uh, between Tim Walls and um, J.D. Vance. And Tim Walls says, well, look at in Minnesota. One year we have a drought and one year we have a, a, a floods. Well, which is it? I mean, if does global warming cause droughts or floods? Because it can't ca cause both. If the if the temperature is warming, it has to cause one or the other. But every time there's an abnormal uh, weather event, they blame they even blame blizzards on <laughs> on global warming. So I think that uh, that the way we solve this problem, if there and by the way, if the if the planet is, to, you know, there, it's probably an El Nino effect that has been causing these warming trends. We need to adapt to it and we have to find the technology to deal with these things um, because you can't have hurricanes destroying the coast of, uh, of the, of the Southeast and so on, but it's going to take technology and it's going to take more investment real private investment and know-how to deal with these climate change things. The idea of giving politicians more money to, to deal with climate change is is pretty pretty poor planning. It's not going to work. And I think this gentleman is exactly right. We have a bigger problem than climate change, and that's something that David Stockman and I were talking about this show earlier. Runaway government spending is the, is the curse of our uh, – country right now. So it's a great point. By the way, that more money hotline, again, 1-800-848-9222. Kristen tells me there's still two lines open. I want to hear from you. Please, if you are a Kamala Harris supporter, because you all know, I've, I've 
you know, I full disclosure, I'm a Trump guy. I'm one of his economic advisors. I've worked with him on and off for eight, eight and a half years. I have great admiration for the man, although I don't always agree with his positions. You know this if you're a regular listener. I don't like tariffs. He does. Uh, and sometimes I don't like, you know, the crazy behavior, but I do like the way that his policies really turned around the American economy. But if you're a, if you're, if you're a Kamala Harris voter, please, please, 1-800-848-9222. I'm going to have it, Christian move you to the front of the line because I want to hear from you in a, in a respectful way and hear your argument because maybe you have something that I haven't thought about. But I just think someone who's never worked for business, never had a real job, frankly, she's been in government and a lawyer, her, you know, a, a government lawyer her whole life, an elected politician. I mean, the joke is that she's so unaccomplished in her career, she has to lie about having worked at McDonald's. But I have a problem with that because I think when you put people in these positions of running our economy, running our national security, commander in chief, they should have some experience about running a company. And not only has Kamala Harris not run a company, she's never even worked for a company. And that's the case with almost all of the people around her. And so you're putting people in charge that don't know how to fly the airplane or, or uh, man the ship. And I think that's a real worry that I have. Okay. I think we have, Al, is it Albo from New Jersey, Christian? Yes, it's Aldo from New Jersey. Okay, Albo, what do you got for us? Hey, first of all, five quick points, Steve. First of all, God bless you and your wonderful staff. You provide a great service, too. Thank you. Every thank you, thank you. It means a lot to me. Goes up in the polls. Wall Street goes down. Also, we have a businessman who's proven himself, and Trump is it. He's done more to help American veterans then all the presidents after Reagan combined. And about the time, another thing is, we have American veterans coming up. Let's keep in our minds and prayers. Vote for Trump. He helps the veterans. 66% of the homeless men and women in America are American veterans. So, hold on. Elbow, time out. Just one second. Are you a veteran yourself? Absolutely. Honorably discharged. And I'm in a basement apartment with a broken wheelchair facing eviction at $2,000 oh a God. month, Steve. And- Wait, so hold on, Elbow. I want to hear your story. So what, what, when were you in the military? What was that? What years were you in the military? I was in the second half of the 1970s, and then I was in a, a reserve reactivated through the 80s, 90s, 20s, first century. I've been applying for compensation from the VA, Going back to when it was the United States Veterans Administration, wow. they denied no, what, me. Which, which uh, Elbow, which which service were you in? American Marines. Marine. Well, gosh, well, I'm saluting you, sir. Thank you for your service. Where were you? And Marines go everywhere and around the world. And let me tell you something, Steve. Uh, Pause of War dot org and stat, uh, out in Long Island and VMCLI in Long Island. And Dr. Esposito and Dr. Powell in Staten Island. Wow. Well, th- thank you again. And so now you're not getting the veterans benefits that you deserve? I'm not getting anything. Why? Because they, I have photographs. When I was quarantined in 1979, oh selfies, God. old-fashioned selfies, proving the uh, left uh, d- d- dentally disabled, dermatologically disabled, and disabled orthopedically. I have wow. statements showing that I experienced accidental falls in quarantine. I have sworn statements, depositions from VA doctors on federal VA letterhead. Well, Elbo, uh, thank you for calling. Appreciate your uh, your patriotism. And uh, we need more people like you in this country that fight for our country and fight for our freedoms. And uh, I think if you're a veteran, you you know, it seems to me it's pretty clear that, that Donald Trump is going to provide you the services, the health care uh, and other kinds of, um, you know, the the uh, all of sorts of the psychiatric, psychiatric care that a lot of our veterans need uh, from uh, PSTD and so on. So I, I'm really uh, I, I'm just so have so much admiration for the people who've worn the uniform and have fought for our country. And I want to go back to one point that I made earlier because I'm being overwhelmed by te- with texts and emails from uh, you know our listeners about this point about the stolen, stealing elections and the fraudulent ballots. This is a big problem 
folks. And I know it's stuck, uh, struck a nerve with many of you because I'm hearing from you. And I don't understand. Let me give you one case of why I'm suspicious of the Democrats. I, by the way, I'm not here to tell you the 2020 election was stolen. I don't know. I don't think we'll ever really know what happened in 2020 because of COVID and the crazy way that we voted. But I will say this. That this is not 2020. This is 2024. COVID is over. There are no health reasons why people can't go to the ballot uh, box. And yet we have um, so many uh, states and so many Democrats that say they will not do voter ID. They will not will require people to show an ID when they show up at the voting booth. And I come on, why? Why would they allow people to vote if they can't even verify they are who they are? I mean, almost everything you do, everywhere you go every, to get an admission into a football game or anything, you have to oftentimes show an ID. To get on an airplane, I flew here uh, to D.C. from Orlando this morning. I had to show my ID to get on that airplane. But you're saying I don't have to show my ID to vote? Now, why is it that Democrats don't want voter ID. Now, what they would say is that's voter suppression or, you know, poor people don't have IDs. Nonsense. Come on. Who doesn't have an ID? Who doesn't have a driver's license or a passport or some ID that shows that they are who they say they are? And if they can't even have, are competent enough to get an ID, are they really even competent enough to vote? And so the Democrats in Congress all voted down a requirement that you have to show <laughs> that you are who you say you are. Why is that something that anybody, and by the way, if you think that if you're against voter ID, let me know. I, I, you know what's interesting, folks? You've got 75% of Americans say they're for voter ID and a, even a higher percentage of minorities, Hispanics and blacks, 75 to 80% say, yes, we should have voter ID. It's not racist. Barack Obama, you're wrong. It's not racist. Joe Biden, you're wrong. Kamala Harris, you're wrong. It's not racist to say you have to show and verify that you are who you say you are and that you're eligible to vote to vote. And I'm the one here who's trying to save our democracy. And I'm sick and tired of the saying, oh, we're trying to undermine democracy by requiring people to have an ID. It's 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 ridiculous. And what they want is these 10 million illegal immigrants to vote. This is an election that could be decided by 100,000 votes in, you know, around these key states. So if you have even one tenth of these people who are here illegally voting, that could decide the election. And I think it would be uh, a calamity if that happened. OK, I will be right back. We're going to take one more break. I'll take a few more of your calls. That more money hotline. I want to hear from you, folks. we got one open line. 1-800-848-9222. This is More Money with economist Steve Moore. Now, Steve Moore. Folks, it is good to be with you. This is the More Money Show. Boy, we've had an exciting show today. I've, I've got my... My uh, blood is pumping uh, because I'm angry about what's going on right now with respect to what might happen on this election in terms of I, I just want it to be a safe and fair election. That's all I want. I want people who are eligible to vote to vote. And I think I don't care if you're going to vote for Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. You should vote. You should vote. Uh, it is one of your responsibilities and rights as a citizen. But non-citizens are not allowed to vote, period, hard stop. OK, uh, God. Darn it, I get so angry about this. All right, we got a couple of callers waiting. We have three or four, and there is one open line. Uh, that's 1-800-848-9222. We're live, folks. We, we are, oh, hold on. We got a call. Porter just called in. So, uh, Christian, uh, why don't we put that person on the line? Absolutely, Steve. We got Caroline from PA. Caroline, thanks so much for calling in. I'm so pleased. Are you a Kamala supporter? Um, yes, I'm a Kamala supporter. Okay. Um, I'd like to know, I'd like to know, Steve, how you could support a man. Those transcripts about January 6th came out yesterday, and when he was told of the rioting at the Capitol, he he sat there and he turned on the TV and he started watching it, and he totally ignored it. He didn't send uh, uh call his dogs off until three hours later. This is worse than Wilson Goodwood's move, where he where he was watching it on it on his yeah. television. The house was burned, and he said he thought it was snow on his TV. He thought the snow yeah. on his TV was water putting out the fire. Now, so do, do you not? 
that this right. is a, a yes. dereliction of duty? Do you yes. not think this man is unfit to serve? Yes. So is it Caroline? Yes. Yeah. Well, th- first of all, where are you in Pennsylvania? I'm in Philadelphia. Oh, Philly. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for listening to the show. And I appreciate your calling in. I'm so pleased you did because I like to hear from the ladies. And I also wanted to hear from Kamala uh, supporters. And I look, I, with great respect, I, I think there's a lot to what you're saying. I I was aghast at what happened on January 6th. I was disgusted by it. Uh, I was on the Capitol grounds on January 5th and I real, I, I could tell that people were angry and I thought things could get out of hand and boy, did they. And I'm embarrassed by that. Um, but so I think there's a lot of truth that, and I respect your opinion. I think that, but Trump did say that these, to his followers, be peaceful. He did say that, but it got out of hand. And I wish Trump had made an earlier statement. I'm with you on this. I wish he had made an earlier statement to these, uh, folks to keep it peaceful. Do not engage in violence. I'm with you on that because I think it was just a horrible, horrible spectacle. And I think the Trump could have done more. So I, I, I think, and, and if that's, something that is, you know, so important to you that you're going to vote on it. I respect your opinion. I'm an economist. I'm just looking more at what's going to happen with their economy if Kamala gets into office with the high taxes and those kinds of things. But I really appreciate the call because you make a great point. Okay, let's get to Al in Yonkers. Oh, we lost Al. Darn it. Okay, Andrew in New Jersey. You're much more nicer and diplomatic than I am. With the last <laughs> I'm not that diplomatic. For her to focus, <laughs> her to focus just on that, he said peacefully and patriotically it was Nancy Pelosi's dereliction of duty. Well, that's, Trump you wanted- know, Al, uh, I mean, this is Andrew. Andrew, uh, that's a very important point you're making. I, I remember because I remember watching the speech and I remember him saying that. Uh, did, he, well, did he say peaceful and patriotic? Exactly. And notice on the January 6th commission, they edited that part out and they plus they cut to a different camera uh, angle to hide the cut. Because if it can was. I sell, can I tell dump. you something, Andrew? Uh, I, I I started to tell Caroline this. I was there on January 5th and I, I drove by on January 6th to see what was going on. And on January 5th, I had a suspicion that things could get really out of hand. When I drove by on January 6th, there was not that there. The security was not there. There was less security there than there would be on a normal day in, you know, when Congress is in session. So I don't know. I'm not a conspiratorialist, but some and you're right, sir. You just made an important point. Who was in charge of the Capitol Police? Nancy Pelosi and Mayor Nancy Bowser. Pelosi. And also why were so many people waved in by the police? And yeah. and um, Antifa was also there, you know, wearing Trump. So there's more to it. But for her to be from Philly and uh, not care about the economy and fracking and inflation and wars and overseas, thousands of people died under Biden Harris that didn't die and wouldn't have died if Trump stayed in office. There wasn't a war in Israel was not attacked. So what what is your uh, I've just got a minute left. Uh, So what is your uh, main reason that you support Trump? For the economic economic jobs bringing back manufacturing yeah. and not oversee no oversee work and lastly school yeah. choice is big and all that he did yeah. like prison sense because in philly okay. where she's from i'm from near newark new jersey and i saw the racism i call it of the of the teachers union when yeah. they block school choice i went yeah. to the school oh i'm a big fan andrew i gotta cut you off because i've got a hard break here i love school choice i think it's the most important thing we can do for uh, black and Hispanic families that are of lower income. Folks, I've had a great time today. I hope you have. Thank you so much for listening to The More Money Show. 